What is the strangest mystery that is still unsolved? What on earth happened to the Trump family? So it's this Australian family who owned a berry farm. Somehow Mr. and Mrs. Trump and their three grown kids developed the belief that they weren't safe and they needed to flee their farm without cell phones or anything traceable, credit cards, etc. It sounds like the oldest son wasn't sold on whatever it was that led them to flee. He brought his phone, but eventually it got tossed from the car. He ended up bailing first and taking a train home. From there the rest of the family slowly separated and suffered various degrees of emotional breaks. The two girls stole a car. Somehow they got separated and one made it home, but the other was found on the floor in the backseat of some guy's car in a catatonic state. He spotted her after he started down the road. Eventually the parents were found wandering around aimlessly. Fortunately they were all okay physically but WTF happened? Was someone actually after them? Were they delusional? As far as I know the family hasn't released any updates. Who was Perseus? From 1943 to 1946, the Soviet Union had a high-level spy in the Manhattan Project. Code name Perseus, this spy was a scientist at the White Sands Missile Testing Site in New Mexico, and the main research facilities in Los Alamos. Perseus saw pretty much the entire project start to finish, giving the Russians everything they needed to get to work on their own bomb. The fact that they were able to do so within four years of the end of World War II when their nations was still devastated is proof positive that Perseus helped a great deal. And to top it all off, Perseus was never caught or positively identified. The whereabouts of the last Gestapo chief Heinrich Mueller. The last verified sighting of him was in Berlin roughly three days before it fell. He had stated he knew full well what the Russians did to prisoners and he had no intentions of being captured. As chief of the Gestapo he more than likely had access to foreign documents as well as ways to replicate them. Both the CIA and the KGB spent time looking for him but no trace has ever been found. I should agree. Girl leaves her house in the middle of the night during a storm and disappeared. The only problem is that she was terrified of thunder and lightning and had no motive for leaving because her home life was fine. Then her clothes and backpack were found a year later in an abandoned construction site. She was spotted on the side of the highway but ran into the woods when anyone stopped. She had apparently packed a bag with some clothes and books which was found buried miles away from her home. She seems to have spent some time in an old shed, evidenced by candy wrappers. Fascinating case and one that keeps me up at night. What would drive a little girl to take off from a loving home into the night in the wind and rain in February? Was she meeting someone? Was she groomed? Unfortunately the case did not generate much popular interest at the time. The Sodder children, their house burned down in the middle of the night. Several of the kids were presumed dead, but their bodies were never found in the debris and it never burned hot enough to cremate them. It started to look extremely suspicious and the parents, until their deaths, believed that they had been taken for some reason. Many years down the line they did receive a photo and cryptic note from someone claiming to be their son but it was never authenticated. Tri-State Crematory a devastating case of a man called back from his college football career to take over his father's business when the father fell ill. Over time people started noticing. Bodies. And body parts. On the grounds. Just hanging around. When someone finally took their reports seriously they found that he'd been piling bodies up randomly all over the property. Often when it would have been much easier to cremate them instead of hauling them around to where they were dumped. The guy gave families canisters of cement dust instead of ashes. The mystery on this one is. Why? The guy never gave up the answer to what happened there and will only insist that there are no answers. His lawyer theorized he had mercury poisoning from cremating amalgam fillings. But that doesn't really explain why you would dump a body instead of cremating it when the latter takes less effort. This is my favorite weird and barely known one. Back in 2013 an unknown group assaulted a power substation in California. By all appearances it was pretty sophisticated. Scouted firing positions, all casings wiped of prints, they targeted transformers so they'd take time to overheat before triggering any alarms, also knew exactly when the police would arrive. No suspect or motive to this day, they also cut some fiber optic cables in a vault nearby. Conspiracy types think it was a dry run by Russia or possibly China to see how effective an attack like that might be. The West Memphis 3 case. All of the satanic panic mess obscured so much that will probably go unanswered now. A bloody man covered in mud stumbled into a Bojangles the night those little boys went missing. 
Cops barely investigated that incident and lost the blood evidence they did collect regarding it. What was going on with John Mark Byers and Terry Hobbs, two dads of two of those kids? Both turning up with evidence and acting at different points like they may have been involved. <laughs> Lars Mittank. A German tourist on vacation in Bulgaria, he got into a fight and the medical complications kept him from going home on a flight with his friends. Staying behind, it looks like his mental state unraveled completely over the course of a few days. Increasing paranoia eventually culminating in his complete disappearance into a field of sunflowers. The Overtoon Bridge. It's a bridge in Scotland where dogs always unexplainably jump off. It's very strange and nobody knows for certain why they do this. Dogs who survived reportedly walked back up and jumped off again. They even had to put up a warning sign to keep your dog on a leash and to watch them. A lot of theories say maybe it's because of certain scents or animals down below, but most people have disagreed with this theory. It's very weird. I don't know exactly what to believe since there's so much misinformation out there, but I'll just believe the articles who've done the most research for now. They say it was most likely not hundreds of dogs, because they can't find reports of that many jumping off like the legend says. It was only around six. But it's still sad and a bit weird that six dogs jumped off. The Tamam Shoot case, also known as the mystery of the Somerton man, is an unsolved case of an unidentified man found dead at 6.30 a.m. December 1, 1948, on the Somerton Park Beach, just south of Adelaide, South Australia. The case is named after the Persian phrase Tamam Shoot, meaning ended or finished, which was printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the fob pocket of the man's trousers. The scrap had been torn from the final page of a copy of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, authored by 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. Tamam was misspelt as Damon in many early reports, and this error has often been repeated, leading to confusion about the name in the media. The Salish Sea Feet or the Mad Axe Man of New Orleans. The Salish Sea Feet are the approximately 20 dismembered feet found in or around British Columbia or Washington, USA. The feet sometimes are found still inside of shoes. No one knows how they got there or where they came from. Over the course of the last 13 years, the authorities have ruled out foul play. The Mad Axe Men of New Orleans ran rampant in 1918 and 1919. He murdered six people, usually those of Italian descent, with axes or straight razors. In March of 1919, he sent a lengthy letter from Hottest Hell that was pretty nonsensical. But the most relevant paragraphs read. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. There were no murders that night because every dance hall in NOLA was filled to capacity. The Konkala Pass in Ladakh. This region lies in the disputed border of India and China, and is truly one of the most inaccessible places in the world. In 1962, the armies of both the countries were engaged in a severe conflict. After this, both China and India entered into an agreement according to which none will be allowed to patrol the region, but can keep an eye on it from a distance. After this, a popular belief floated that the Konkala Pass in Ladakh is a hideous base of UFOs. The area has forever remained a no-man's land due to its territorial limits and is the reason why the UFOs have chosen it as their operational base. Reportedly, many have seen these UFOs and both the Indian and Chinese governments are aware of these developments. In 2006, Google Maps 2 baffled the world with some images that looked like military facilities, but till date the whole issue remains mysterious and unexplainable. Three lighthouse workers with impeccable mustaches traveled to a remote island on December 7, 1900 for a lighthouse shift that should have lasted for two weeks. When a boat arrived to pick them up, they were gone. No trace of the bodies, and the lighthouse was strangely locked. Not only was the setting normal, meal ready to be served, but there was no fire in the fireplace, and the clock stopped. One of the men kept a log in a diary, and he said that the seas were rough one day, but when monitored, it was actually calm. No one knows what happened to them. MV Joita. Barnacle growth high above the usual waterline on the port side showed that Joita had been listing heavily for some time. 
There was some damage to the superstructure. Her flying bridge had been smashed away and the deckhouse had light damage and broken windows. A canvas awning had been rigged on top of the deckhouse behind the bridge. Joyita carried a dinghy and three Carly life rafts, but all were missing. She did not carry enough life jackets for everyone on board. The starboard engine was found to be covered by mattresses, while the port engine's clutch was still partially disassembled, showing that the vessel was still running on only one engine. An auxiliary pump had been rigged in the engine room, mounted on a plank of wood slung between the main engines. However, it had not been connected. The radio on board was tuned to the International Distress Channel. But when the equipment was inspected, a break was found in the cable between the set and the aerial. The cable had been painted over, obscuring the break. This would have limited the range of the radio to about 2 miles, 3.2 kilometers. The electric clocks on board, wired into the vessel's generator, had stopped at 10.25 and the switches for the cabin lighting and navigation lights were on, implying that whatever had occurred happened at night. The ship's logbook, sextant, mechanical chronometer and other navigational equipment, as well as the firearms Miller kept in the boat, were missing. A doctor's bag was found on deck, containing a stethoscope, a scalpel, and four lengths of bloodstain bandages. In 1994, close to a hundred school children, 60 on record, described seeing a disc-shaped craft land behind their school during morning break time in Rua, Zimbabwe. Many of them interacted with beings, that fit the grey alien description, with the children receiving what is described as some sort of telepathic communication. They all still stick to their stories today. The original footage of the interviews with the kids at the school can be found on YouTube. The toxic death of Gloria Ramirez. 23 people became ill due to her mere presence and 5 were hospitalized. We have never worked out what happened. There's an episode of the Stuff You Should Know podcast that talks about it. About 8.15 p.m. on the evening of February 19, 1994. Ramirez, suffering from severe heart palpitations, was brought into the emergency department of Riverside General Hospital by paramedics. She was extremely confused and was suffering from tachycardia and chain stokes respiration. The medical staff injected her with diazepam, midazolam, and lorazepam to sedate her. When it became clear that Ramirez was responding poorly to treatment, the staff tried to defibrillate her heart. At that point several people saw an oily sheen covering Ramirez's body and some noticed a fruity, garlic-like odor that they thought was coming from her mouth. A registered nurse named Susan Kane attempted to draw blood from Ramirez's arm and noticed an ammonia-like smell coming from the tube. She passed the syringe to Julie Gorjinsky, a medical resident, who noticed manila-colored particles floating in the blood. At this point, Kane fainted and was removed from the room. Shortly thereafter, Gorjinsky began to feel nauseated. Complaining that she was lightheaded, she left the trauma room and sat at a nurse's desk. A staff member asked her if she was okay, but before she could respond she also fainted. Maureen Welch, a respiratory therapist who was assisting in the trauma room was the third to pass out. The staff was then ordered to evacuate all emergency department patients to the parking lot outside the hospital. Overall, 23 people became ill and 5 were hospitalized. A skeleton crew stayed behind to stabilize Ramirez. At 8.50 p.m., after 45 minutes of CPR and defibrillation, Ramirez was pronounced dead from kidney failure related to her cancer. The self-destruction of Ellen Greenberg. 20 stab wounds in different areas of the body. Self-destruction stabbings are so ridiculous. There's a case from Denmark in 2003 where a woman was found dead by her husband who called the police and said she had ended herself. She was on the bedroom floor next to a broken lamp, her wristwatch was torn off and she had 179 stab wounds. Because it was a Sunday they had to call in a criminal assistant on his off day, and he deemed it a self-end, because she had a history of depression. On April 19, 1995, a truck bomb detonated outside the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The explosion killed 168 in what was the deadliest terrorist attack on the United States until 9-11, to date, it still remains the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in the country. One of the lesser known things about this is the case of the missing leg. Investigators discovered the leg laying among the rubble and identified it belonging to Lakeisha Levy. The only problem was, she'd already been buried with both her legs. She was exhumed, her severed leg was placed in her coffin while the other leg was taken to the FBI laboratory for identification. Since it had been embalmed, a DNA sample was unable to be obtained. 
The extra left leg, which had been mistakenly buried with Levy, is suspected to belong to an unidentified 169th victim, whose body had mostly disintegrated in the blast. This has led people to suspect there was an additional terrorist involved even though perpetrators Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols had been convicted, with two others later identified as accomplices. So who is the possible additional bomber? They still remain unidentified now 25 years after the attack. Literally any dig site in archaeology. Even the ones that are just garbage and pots herds are fascinating if you try to really picture the people behind them, what they thought and felt. Actually, garbage probably tells you more about people than anything else, really. But my favorite is Chauvet Cave. If you have a chance, watch Werner Herzog's documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams. I think it's still on Netflix, it has some of the most stunning cave art in the world, which almost certainly had some kind of profound significance, and we don't, and will likely never, know what it is. Moreover, there's evidence that the cave was abandoned for thousands of years and later returned to. Only for the returnees to continue to make paintings in the exact same style and, possibly, for the exact same reasons. There is so much to be seen in these figures. There's a portrait of an animal tossing its head that looks like one of the world's earliest explorations of stop motion or sequential art. When I look at it I can feel the will of the painter, who wanted so much to convey this sort of motion. There are also the footprints of a boy, who arrived much later to the cave than its original users, whose marks appear to be contemporary with the paw prints of a wolf. It's hard to say now, according to Cave of Forgotten Dreams, whether they walk together, whether they walked 20 years apart, whether they were friends or whether the wolf was stalking the boy. But I read a blog post by a professional hunter and tracker, who looked at the footage of the prints from the film and said that they likely walked together. I wonder what they were thinking. If the boy had some knowledge of what he would find there, or if he was simply exploring a cave and found some of the greatest art in human history. In Chauvet there is also the solution to a mystery. Until the discovery of Chauvet Cave paleontologists were unsure as to whether cave lions had manes. On the cave walls there is an illustration of a cave lion with visible testicles and no mane, settling that debate. Please like and subscribe, and tap the notification bell icon below to get notified of more Reddit DTS videos. This is Reddit Joe channel. Your everyday Reddit.